we were one big happy family on a wagon train headed to Washington, D.C. The mule train was headed for the nation's capital where several thousand persons have set up Resurrection City to demonstrate for jobs and income. Uh, it was just magnificent to see all those folk out there welcoming us to the 1968 Pro People's Campaign, which was held in Resurrection City in Washington, D.C. Hello and welcome to this special Black History program. Uh, my name is Mickey Thompson. I'm the mayor of the city of Douglasville and I will be your host for today. It's always interesting to bring things to you from a special perspective. Uh, today we're going to do that. Uh, with me is a very special guest and he is going to bring to us uh, some of the events that happened in the city of Douglasville 43 years ago. Let me introduce to you a very special guest today, Reverend Ralph David Avernathy III. Thank you. Thank you for being with us today, Reverend. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Reverend Abernathy, before we get started uh, with our program today, I wonder if you could just take a few minutes and tell us uh, and our viewers a little bit about yourself. Well, okay. Uh, I am the son of a civil rights leader, uh, Reverend Dr. Ralph David Abernathy, Sr., and uh, my mother, Mrs. Juanita Jones Abernathy. Uh, my father was Martin Luther King's best friend, as well as his partner in the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, my father pastored the First Baptist Church of Montgomery, Alabama. And when Rosa Parks was arrested, they called my father to organize the community and the ministers around Ms. Parks' arrest who at that time was the NAACP secretary. Mrs. Parks, um, uh, the NAACP president, E.D. Nixon, was a Pullman car porter, and he was on his way out of town that night of Mrs. Parks' arrest. So he called a young Turk preacher who was pastoring the First Baptist Church of Montgomery, Alabama, my father, to organize the community as he had to leave to go to work. My father, in turn, went around organizing, calling all of the ministers, and uh, called his newfound friend, who had just gotten to uh, Montgomery, Martin Luther King, Jr. And that was the beginning of their partnership through history. And uh, it lasted until my uh, father and Martin Luther King shared the uh, same room together at the Lorraine Motel. There were double beds in that room. Uh, my father was out on the balcony waiting for whom I affectionately call Uncle Martin, uh, and he came out on the balcony and my father smelled his Aramis cologne. And he said, Martin, I forgot to put my Aramis on. And uh, Uncle Martin said, well, Ralph, I'll be out here on the balcony waiting on you. And when my father went back into uh, the bedroom and the bathroom to put the cologne in his hands, he heard the firecracker shots and immediately he thought about Uncle Martin. He then left, and um, when he was uh, shot, he did not die on the balcony. He died in the, Lorraine, in the hospital in Memphis, Tennessee. No one was allowed to travel with uh, the ambulance but my father and Martin Luther King's assistant, who was Reverend Bernard Lee. Reverend Lee was a, a short individual, and I think he had a kind of a Napoleonic complex. And he said, nobody's getting in the ambulance but Dr. Abernathy. And so my father went to the hospital with uh, Martin, and he said he committed uh, what they call civil disobedience. He refused to leave the operating room. And at some point in time, the doctors came over and said, Dr. Abernathy, there's no more we can do uh, for him. And my father went over and cradled him in his arms, and he took his last breath in my father's arms. Uh, from that point forward, my father then became the president of the organization that he and Dr. King founded, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And he completed the work that had been started by he and Uncle Martin. And at that time, they were in the process of developing the Poor People's Campaign. And he finished and completed the Poor People's Campaign and many other marches and demonstrations for uh, equal rights and equality in this country. And so I am the son, and, and that is my legacy. And, uh, that's where my loins come from. 
How old was your father at that time? My father was, um, I want to say, 36 or 37. When he became president of SCLC, I believe he was in his 40s, late 40s, early, yeah, late 40s. Mm -hmm. And you're just a child then? Yes, I was just a baby. Okay. We were, I was born in Montgomery, Alabama at the age of three. My mother's home was bombed. Uh, and the night that they bombed Dr. King's home, the next night they bombed my father and mother's home. My mother was home uh, with my oldest sister, Wanderlyn, who is an opera singer, and she lives in Europe. She sings with the Munich Opera. And she was pregnant with Donzele, who is an actress that lives in Los Angeles. Uh, the bomb was three inches from the main gas line. My father and Martin Luther King were here in Atlanta, Georgia, planning and forming the Southern Christian Leadership Conference when the news uh, came that uh, my, my father's home was bombed uh, with my mother home and my babies, well, my oldest sister uh, in the crib. Mm -hmm. They rushed back to Montgomery. Three years later, I was born. And we moved, uh, when I was three, we moved from Montgomery to Atlanta, Georgia at the behest of Martin Luther King, who convinced my father to move to Atlanta, and he uh, found his father, Daddy King Sr., found my father a church and convinced uh, him to move to Atlanta, uh, and um, my father pastored that church for another 30 years. That was the West Hunter Street Baptist Church, which is now on Ralph David Abernathy Boulevard. We have one thing in common. I'm originally from Alabama also. Oh, really? And ended up in Atlanta. Well, suburb of Atlanta. What part of Alabama? A uh, small town, Heflin, Alabama, which is about 55 miles from here. Well, you're a good man. There are some good people in Alabama. That's right. I, you know, I run into people from Alabama all the time. A part of our Georgia Municipal Association, uh, several of those folks are from Alabama. And so uh, it's interesting. You know, you, you talk to folks, and although we're uh, Georgia residents now, both of us have been for many, many years, uh, we do have our roots in the same place. That's exactly right. Yeah. You're good people. Thank you. Good people come from Alabama. That's right. <laughs> well, Reverend, thank you for that background information. I wanted to give our viewers a little background information about a very important historical event that actually happened right here in Douglasville. And it's my understanding that 43 years ago, uh, as a young child, uh, nine years old, you were here in Douglasville. And uh, when you told me this story first, I said, you know, this is something that everyone in our community and everyone in our city and all of our viewers are going to be very interested in. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about the event and, and what you remember, and I realize you're only nine years old, but what you remember about that event here in Douglasville? Well, I remember um, <clears throat> us coming from, we were on what is called a mule train, and uh, many of your viewers may not know what a mule train was, but it was uh, a march uh, where uh, the people who were marching from one city to another would uh, march with mules. Mules, we chose the mules because the uh, mule was the poor man's animal. And uh, we were picking up on the completion of the work that uh, my father and Dr. King had started. This was after his death. This was after his assassination uh, and the completion of the poor people's campaign. And uh, what the Poor People's Campaign was, was a, a, a journey from, it started in Marks, Mississippi, and it moved all the way, picking up people along the way, all the way from Marks, Mississippi to Washington, D.C. And the route came through Douglasville, Georgia. Well, before we get into uh, a lot of the details uh, about what you remember, we have a uh, piece that we'd like to show the viewers, which includes a lot of the details about it. This is a piece that was taken from the Titusville, Pennsylvania, Saturday morning newspaper, dated June 15, 1968. Police arrested 67 members of a Poor People's Campaign Mule Train Friday, and the wagon boss vowed to remain in jail until allowed to continue on the interstate highway where they were taken into custody. State patrolmen halted the Washington-bound caravan after it began moving onto a busy expressway 30 miles west of Atlanta, despite a warning from officers that state law 
prohibits pedestrians and non-motorized vehicles on a multi-lane road. 67 adults were charged with violating that law, a misdemeanor, and were taken to a National Guard armory where they remained in custody hours later. Also detained were 32 juveniles, 16 or under, who were later released but chose to remain with the adults. Bond was set at $100 for the adults. Among the children were the nine-year-old son of the Reverend Ralph David Abernathy, president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, and two young sons of Hosea Williams, a top SCLC official and campaign leader. The mule train was headed for the nation's capital where several thousand persons have set up Resurrection City to demonstrate for jobs and income. Wagon Master Willie Bolden, an SCLC official in charge of the mule train segment of the Poor People Campaign, spurned offers from Governor Lester Maddox and Douglas County Sheriff Claude Abercrombie, under which those arrested could continue their journey without prosecution. Maddox offered to use state equipment to transfer the 13 rattle trap wagons, 23 mules, and three horses to any point in Georgia presumably toward the state line. Maddox also offered to waive state law and allow the group to use the highway Interstate 20 between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. when traffic is relatively light. The sheriff volunteered to release everyone if they would take an alternate route into Atlanta. Bolden rejected both offers. We will continue on Interstate 20, he said. I remember saying to Governor Lester Maddox and the commander of the Highway State Patrol that I was going to continue on Highway 20. And the reason I said that was because the governor of Mississippi allowed us to use one side of 20 to travel to Washington, D.C. The governor of Alabama, who I believe at that time was Governor Early and Wallace, allowed us to travel 20 on our way to Washington, D.C. And it was only when we got to Georgia, to Douglasville, Georgia, Governor Lester Maddox wanted to stop us from traveling on 20. He offered at that time to load our mules and wagons on uh, some trucks that would be provided by the National Guard and they were gonna put our people in buses and transport us to Atlanta, Georgia. And of course, I refused both of those orders. As a result, they locked me up. They put me in jail. My right-hand man at that time, who was Andrew Marset, after they locked me up, decided to bring the mules, the wagons, and all of the participants of the mule train down to the city jail in Douglasville. And there, they were going to sing freedom songs like they did and vowed to stay there until they turned me loose. It was sometime later, maybe three or four hours, I guess, the white power structure got together and decided that maybe the best thing to do was to let me out. And when they did, uh, I came out and everybody was jumping up, cheering, cheering, here's our wagon, wagon master, here's our wagon master. And we had a mass rally in a field and then I told everyone to come on now, let's get a good night's sleep so we can get ready to get on 20 and come to Atlanta, Georgia. And that's exactly what we did. Uh, the next morning we got up, uh, we made sure and always made sure that our mules were properly fed. We fed them hay, we fed them oats, we brushed them down every night. Uh, I had a young man from Mississippi who was an expert at shoeing horses because I knew that the Humane Society was going to be sick on us, and guess what? They did, but they couldn't find anything wrong with those mules. They tried because we made sure that the mules were properly shod, properly fed, properly rubbed down, and we got up the next morning and came to Atlanta, Georgia. Reverend Abernathy, I appreciate you being our guest here on City TV in Douglasville today. And our viewers have had an opportunity to uh, look at some of the reference material. I wonder, and I realize you're only nine years old, just a, a young boy at that time, but could you tell us a little bit about what you remember 
about that event here in Douglasville, Georgia? Well, let me just first say that it was almost like my baptismal into the civil rights movement. Uh, for me, um, I had seen my father and Martin Luther King arrested many, many, many times before. I had um, uh, grown up uh, and Martin Luther King wouldn't go to jail without my daddy. And um, it was, an, it was a, a, many other people, Jose Williams and many other of the staff had been arrested uh, marching uh, for the freedom of people in America as well as uh, for poor people. And so this was uh, my, almost my baptismal into the civil rights movement uh, at uh, the young tender age of nine. And I remember the march, I remember the mule train, I remember the, um, the spirit of the camaraderie of uh, family. Uh, I remember uh, the fun that I had as a child, uh, getting, jumping up on the wagon and um, uh, holding the reins and um, uh, rolling down the road with, uh, uh, rain, with reins in hand of the movement. Uh, I remember that. Uh, I remember the, uh, the, the spirit of family that uh, existed among the uh, civil rights workers. And they looked at me as, I was little Ralph. And uh, they certainly, um, I was a rumbunctious, boy, uh, all boy kind of kid and always playing with the uh, staff and always uh, being very jovial and, and, and a bad kid. Uh, and uh, just had a lot of fun. And it was just a wonderful uh, opportunity. When we got stopped uh, in Douglasville on our way to uh, Washington, D.C. by way of Douglasville into Atlanta. Um, we were supposed to be going to meet um, a rally at my father's church, the West Hunter Street Baptist mm -hmm. Church. And um, I remember, I recall, my sister reminds me now, Donzele, of the fact that um, when she heard I had been arrested and um, uh, she said that she got up a little envious and jealous of the fact that I had been uh, arrested and she didn't get a chance to, to, to get arrested. Uh, her being a few years older than me, she was able to remember and recall the fact that I was, they said that I was afraid. And as she mentioned that to me, I could see when I was afraid. You were nine years yeah, old. I could, I could remember the time that I was a little fearful of that, uh, of the arrest itself. Not really knowing of the unknown, not knowing the unknown of where we're gonna go and what's gonna happen to us. After we settled in at um, uh, the National Guard Armory, I remember them taking us to this building, this huge building where we, we uh, kind of just all settled in at the armory. The building is still standing today, and it's still used as an armory, by the way. Wow, isn't sure that special? Is. Mm -hmm. Well, I remember being there, and I remember the fact that um, the community uh, came out and supported us. We and we uh, there was food available from the uh, citizens of Douglasville. There was um, uh, a spirit of family and support uh, that came from throughout the community, and uh, that settled my spirit, settled me into my young, energetic, nine-year-old, rambunctious <laughs> uh, personality. And uh, the rest of the e the rest of the evening, I was I was all right. Um, I remembered at that time that uh, I knew we were marching for poor people. I knew that uh, we were marching for change in America. Uh, the results of, those, uh, of that poor people's campaign um, uh, gave us welfare rights, gave us food stamps, uh, gave us a welfare uh, 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 program, gave us um, a minimum wage, and other things that were needed to help bring up uh, a people who have been denied equal opportunity and access, uh, not just African Americans, but poor people in general. And so I understood that what we were doing was powerful uh, and was, uh, I had no, no idea at the time how significant it was, but I grew into its significance. And uh, th those are the things that made an impact on my life and have, um, uh, and I understand now why my sister was a little envious of me because she was, it was true that this was my baptismal. And it was a historical moment. Very historical, also. very historical. Were you here overnight, just one yes. night? Yeah, and we then... spent one night, and the next day we uh, came, uh, we left and finished our, our journey to West Hunter Street Baptist Church. When we arrived at the church, I remember greeting my father, who was so concerned 
and so worried, along with Hosea Williams and all the other uh, 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 staff members. And I remember saying to him, Daddy, what are you so upset about? My mother was <laughs> there. Everybody was worried. I said, what is everybody upset about? You do this all the time. <laughs> and uh, so it was no big deal uh, for me at that, at that moment. But uh, it was a real big deal uh, for them, and it was a real big deal for America uh, for the work that we were doing to help effect the change that we live and in, in, in the quality of life that we live today. I remember when we talked uh, on the phone a few weeks ago, uh, which, by the way, you call me trying to help someone. Yes, that's correct. Uh, that's here in Douglasville, and I certainly appreciate that, and I think we've been able to uh, help that lady, and I certainly hope yes, she's you doing Yes, you have. You absolutely well. have. And, and it's amazing how the Lord works, because when I called you, it was never an intention to talk to you. In fact, it just dawned on me when I was on the phone with the mayor of Douglasville that I would just read that article to you. I was calling to help uh, 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 someone who is a citizen of this city, and um, you, you obliged me with the phone call, obliged me with your assistance. And then as we were getting off of the phone, it just dawned on me to call to, to read the article to you. And from that, um, we are here today. Well, I'm glad you told me that story uh, because when I heard the story, uh, and I remembered after you kind of uh, spiked my memory back 43 years ago, I remember about reading about it in the paper. I didn't live here at that time. And I thought this would be perfect uh, during Black History Month for you to tell those who live here in Douglasville. A lot of them may be like me today that didn't live here at that time. And right. we certainly appreciate you taking your time to do it today. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you for your interest in the story. Uh, I think that it is a part of the fabric of America, which has helped to make us the great country that we are today. And uh, God bless you and God bless the citizens. Well, thank you. And it's a fabric of our city, yes, the city of ab Douglasville. Absolutely, which yes. is America. Right. Well, thank you for joining us today. It certainly was my pleasure. And I know our viewers on City TV and here in Douglasville and Douglas County appreciate you being here also. It was my honor to have you here in Douglasville. Thank you, Mr. Again, <laughs> after 43 years. Yes. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's an honor to be here with you uh, and to be here with uh, the citizens of this great city and to have had my story, uh, my baptismal here in, in the city, uh, as great as Douglasville, and be a part of that a greater American story. So thank you and God bless you and God bless the citizens of Douglasville. And thank you for joining us today for this very special show. Oh, um, this is and you're so nice. Wonder, what does this mean? Yeah, that's a tree. It's a it's tree a, um, and there's a, there's a story behind the tree. It, uh, it was a skint chestnut. The city of Douglasville's chestnut. name for Douglasville was skint chestnut at one point in time. What is skint chestnut? It's a tree, and the reason it's a skint chestnut, it was just a regular chestnut tree. The Indians took the bark off of the tree as a landmark okay. for their community. Okay. And so I, our founding father selected that as a part of the city seal. Uh, okay. So this was a, an Indian territory at okay. one time. And uh, Douglasville was a center of activity, and they wanted to mark uh, their activity or the area of their activity with some significance, and so other people could find it. And so and they took they, all the bark off the tree. They took all the, the bark off the tree, and then they would, that would be the, the landmark. The landmark, the right. They would, they yeah. Realize that they, uh, okay. Where Chestnut was. Wow. Isn't that special? Yeah. Okay. So well, we'll thank have you. that. Thank you. I appreciate You're that. I welcome. love LaPierre. <laughs>